graduate from NASA Johnson Space Center. I'm the software and applications lead for the Roadman App Project. And I want to talk to you about our preparations for intravehicular uh, mobility. I want to uh, acknowledge some of my team members. Uh, Ron Dippler is the program manager, project manager. Um, Aaron Wells, Ross Taylor, whose work was um, uh, completely essential to this, this presentation, um, as for work of many of the other crew member, the team members. Uh, Robonaut 2 is a project that and it's based on a bigger project, the Robonaut project, that started uh, about 15 years ago with Robonaut 1. It was a partnership with DARPA, and Robonaut has always been um, intended to be an astronaut assistant. And so basically uh, a robot that can work around humans with humans in his workspace, work with the tools that humans use, be at least as dexterous as a suited astronaut, if not more so, and actually be able to do real work. As you see here, it's actually lifting a, a real 20 pound weight and um, moving it around. Um, Robonaut 2 came around when GM approached us in about 2007. In 2009, we had our, our first R2A uh, unit, as you see in the video here. And R2B um, was launched on STS-133 in February of 2011. We have are an interesting payload in that uh, we're doing a lot of research, a lot of robotics research. There's things that we learn every single time we turn a robot on. Um, but at the same time, we really do want to be a useful payload. We want to be a contributing member of the crew on ISS, both inside and outside. And so a lot of our research kind of centers around that. So once we got up there, um, it took us about six months to get out of the box. Once we did that, we had a small checkout phase. We did some free space activities. Um, then we did some activities on the task board, basically manipulation tasks that um, we set up these panels. I'll show you on another slide. And it showed that we could do those sorts of things. We're winding down on, on that and, and ramping up on using IVA tools. So uh, different things that um, we can do around station, different tasks that we might be able to do once we become mobile. Um, by the end of the year, we're hoping to send up um, a mobility platform. And so we're preparing for that um, in several ways. Um, but all of these preparations are truly so that we can eventually go EVA. Um, the idea behind Robonaut is to do the dull and dangerous tasks on the space station. Um, inside we basically get dull, uh, you know, there's not so much dangerous in there that, that we'll be able to do. But outside, you know, anything that we could do to you know, set up for space locks, take down, or remove, you know, thermal blankets for the big robots, SSRMS, and uh, excerpt to manipulate ORUs around, um, that's definitely a useful thing for us to do. So I'm going to show um, lots of movies, and this is the first one. Um, this is one of our um, more recent um, task board activities. We are kind of doing series of um, different tasks that we're doing. We're trying to make them more complicated and, and more capable each time. This is the first time we did white manipulation. Um, and we grabbed a wipe out of um, one of the wipe containers with the same hand as we're using to now kind of wipe off a handrail. Um, you see Sunny Williams in the background uh, taking pictures of us doing that. And then we are planning on in the next, I think, five to eight weeks. Um, continuing on with that, we're actually going to grab a wipe and then transfer hands to get it into a nice grasp so that we can actually grab the handrail and clean the entire handrail off and kind of continue the research that way. The other things we're doing is IVA tools. Um, we have several pictures here. Um, this picture is R2 doing the VelociCalc tool. It's an airflow measurement device. We've done this twice. The second time around, we added vision recognition for the actual data that shows up on, on the uh, sensor screen, as well as um, understanding a little bit more about how to move the trajectory around. We can barely reach that air filter, so we're excited to become mobile so we can get a little closer to these things. We've also been playing with the soft goods task panel. This is sort of in preparation for EVA, removing thermal blankets. We have a series of um, ops working with that where we you know, use the quarter turn latches and we pulled back the, the blanket and um, in about four weeks we're gonna be manipulating the objects inside and showing that we can um, do things in cargo bags and, and other sorts of um, soft goods manipulation. And the toppy video over on the side is uh, actually an ops that we're going to be doing next Tuesday. Um, R2 is going to be playing with the inventory, an RFID reader. We're going to give them a half-size cargo bag full of 
from RFID tag thing, and I had it do the inventory class. So um, the cool stuff about this, this is the first time doing it, but so we'll be able to identify the bag using the <coughs> system, localize it. Um, it'll be attached to a, the wall that's kind of in front of our queue when it's turned around, um, and it'll have a wall awareness algorithm, and it'll be able to do the trajectory, um, but to the points that it can reach within its workspace on the top and sides of the bag to try to scan all of the objects in there. Eventually we would like to um, actually use the other hand to manipulate the bag and, and uh, do a better job of the inventory task, and that'll be part of this series. Um, other things that we're doing is eventually we're going to go mobile, so we're really excited about that. And we want to um, you know, be able to climb around with as minimal amount of supervision as possible, though there'll be quite a bit, at least in the beginning. And so one thing we did was we said, okay, using the eyes, can we find handrails? And so we took a shot down the lab, and it's hard for me to find handrails in there, so it was really hard for our vision owner to find it too. But we learned a lot about it. We're actually setting up a new helmet even because of some of the things we learned about what it is like seeing through our two eyes on the station. And um, we're improving our vision of um, with all the data that we're getting so far. So that when we do get the legs up there, we'll be able to climb around. So here is um, here are the upgrades that we're going to do. This is the entire um, R2. It's really tall. It's about eight foot ten or eight foot tall. Um, it'll be um, crouched up inside the space station, climbing around. The upgrades are, of course, including these legs, seven degrees of freedom apiece with the gripping end effector. Uh, it can interface with IBA, EBA handrails as well as seat track and the whip device for EBA. Um, each end effector features a vision package. It has a camera and a time of flight measurement device so that we can uh, basically visual scroll into handrails knowing if they're um, you know, wires or you know, zip ties or whatever blocking them. We're going to set up a lithium ion battery backpack for two reasons. One is because um, we have a lot of motors and we don't want to give that um, uh, draw onto the space station power supply when we're running all at once. The other reason is we want to go wireless. So not only not having a power cord, but there will be a wireless <coughs> card in the backpack so that we can interface with the lab wireless network. So uh, some of the things we learned about while we were playing with Robonaut this year on space station is that um, you know the, the control system that we sent it up with was great for down here. It was really important for um, NASA and GM to have the same sorts of things, and it really worked well for what we wanted to do in the lab. It worked okay on Space Station, but we had a lot of things that we really wished we had. And so we're taking this opportunity of sending up legs and new processors to redo some stuff. And so the control system requirements are a little wish list that we came up with. Um, include some of the same stuff, like safe to have humans in the workspace while running. That is the core tenet of the Robonaut project forever and continue to be. Um, something that's a little new is we need to uh, control the end effectors precisely. Um, in in general, we don't necessarily have to do that as much with the hand, but with the grabbing onto the seat track, you know, the, the seat track you see on airplanes, it's really kind of hard. You have to be pretty precise to get the inspectors in there. And so we need the capability to do that. We also need to adjust between controlling um, the different dynamics that we're going to see. So if you can imagine, you see this picture where he's reaching out and climbing and growing the other handrail, and it's got this roll joint at the very end on the ankle, and it has very low effective inertia on the climbing leg but really high effective inertia on the other leg. Well, during you know, two steps, you see the two extremes. And so we need the ability to kind of automatically adjust for this um, very high swing in inertia and controlling it um, effectively. We are also adding another 14 to 16 degrees of freedom to an already high degree of freedom system, so we need to be able to coordinate that control effectively. So um, we changed our overall architecture of our control system. Here's a picture of it. Um, we are continuing on with impedance control, which is what we had on the other robot. Impedance control um, is basically a position reference achieved by a torque loop. Um, however, we used to do the, this, the impedance loop on the, on the brainstem, the coordinated control side. We're now moving those all to the embedded controllers, the motor controllers. So per joint, we have an impedance controller that is um, able to uh, control the amount of joint torque that it puts out, as well as achieve position references with a high degree of accuracy. The other face that with that on the brainstem was um, over MLVDS using the roadmap, kind of takes all the data, 
puts it into the appropriate places. The Join API is a layer that makes everything look the same. There are lots of different types of joints on R2, and we want them all to be, to be able to interface with the, our dynamics controller the same way. And then Road 9 up here, along with the motor controllers, are the, is the essential part of our control system. Um, I'll talk about that more in the next slide. But we basically expect that with that core control system, we'll be able to add supervisory control um, components or functions that, that can do different tasks or things, like auto docking or handrails and that sort of thing, um, to have that arbitrated um, and supervised using a, a user interface. So Robodyne is made up of um, two different types of components. Um, over there in the green are kinematic components. One huge departure from what we've done before is we actually are using inverse kinematics on this robot, which is so amazing to me because it makes my life lots easier than a lot of applications that we built. But we basically take data in, um, you know, do the, the reference uh, for kinematics, and we know where we are. And then we have a trajectory monitor in the manager that incorporates that uh, uh, IK. We're using a task reconstruction formulation of IK which allows us to optimize our null space. The uh, kind of cool thing that we're doing with that null space optimization um, is due to some of the safety requirements we have, Robonaut's a big guy, and so we need to be able to control our momentum. And so we're doing a, a, a kinetic energy optimization, which basically uh, penalizes moving large masses. And so we'll be able to move our arms pretty fast, but our body really slow. And we're gonna kind of get that automatically from our, our IK. Over on the red side here are dynamics components. Um, these make the joint controllers able to um, really effectively achieve the position references that they're, they're being sent down with. Um, it's mostly due to the uh, recursive new Euler inverse dyna dynamics calculation that we're doing. We are compensating for the inertial or the acceleration loads or on our curve, compensating for gravity. And so this becomes a feed forward torque that we send back to the joint. It goes around that position loop and basically makes it so that the, the joint torques that are needed to, for, to achieve the position reference are really low. And so we can limit those to be really low, which contributes to our safety, you know, making sure that our joint torque limits are just not going to be able to push hard on anything. We um, calculate the effective inertia per joint in our ID uh, component and we feed that into our desired dynamics. Um, this is where we get the ability to handle the effective inertias. Basically, the user gets to specify the desired dynamics of the system, natural frequency and damping ratio e of each joint, based on what we want to see. Um, and then, with the inertia, we calculate the gains, the, the stiffness and damping, for the position loop of each joint, at the impedance uh, loop of each joint. So, that gets them down and, and uh, helps us to achieve our so now I'm going to show you some movies about how this all looks. Um, one of our requirements is accurate motion control. Um, we're actually doing this whole thing at a very low joint torque. I think it's set to 20 newton meters per joint. Um, so obviously doing gravity compensation. And it's be being driven to specific Cartesian points on the board. I think it's going to drop trapezoid in this one. At the very end, you'll see it actually goes back to where it came from. This is really useful because if you can you know, control it to this amount, then it's easier to grab onto the handrails and do that sort of thing. Another application that we're talking about for EVA is welding, and this sort of capability is really useful to be able to, uh, to do that. Being safe around humans. This is my favorite video. My uh, colleague Ross was the little stucky getting hit by a robot. Um, again, really low torque limits. You can see it hardly, you know, gives them any pause that you get hit by a robot. Um, you also can see that it actually stops. It waits. It knows that it hit its torque limits, and we call this replan. Um, and it's waiting for Ross to give it a little nudge before it starts up. The little nudge is an application specific. Thing that we put in, we decided that hey, in this you know trajectory, the uh, we call this hit Ron demo because it's our, our project manager. Um, this hit Ross right now, um, but um, we decided that we want it to restart when we touch it, when we nudge it again. 
Uh, we don't have to do that. It always stops, but it doesn't have to restart. So we can, um, on our application layer, decide how we want to do that. And here's a video of it climbing. Um, our team is in Johnson Space Center's uh, gravity offload facility, uh, Argos, and uh, it still sees the entire effective inertia of, of the robot, which is substantial. Um, but as you can tell, it's going to move across, and you've got um, both legs working to, to move it. And so there's, um, we actually have both joint torques on and um, high gains on both of them, but low joint torques on the other on the ring, slightly larger, larger joint torques on the other leg. And um, we are, uh, once we go into dock, we actually loosen that climbing leg a lot. We make it really, really loose, and so it's not holding its position hardly at all, so that when we are going on to grab it, we can do that um, effectively. And so there's a lot of uh, cool effects of, of our control system in in just you know taking a step and climbing from handrail to handrail. I'm actually way ahead of schedule. <laughs> Must be talking too fast, sorry about that. So um, what I've talked to you about today are there are many preparations for our team mobility. Uh, we've been doing a lot of on-orbit stuff. Everything that we've been doing on orbit really has been with an eye towards becoming a useful crew member. Um, but we've done a lot of pushing of uh, in the bounds of some of this robotics um, research, technology development in the same time. Um, where I think we've really <coughs> moved into robotics and, and um, the world is on the ground development and mobility system. The uh, combination of being really accurate, but yet having these really low joint torques and having humans able to come over and just not get out of the way, no big deal, um, is pretty special. There's a lot of people trying to do the same sort of thing with industrial manipulators, which is why GM came to us to basically have that ability to get the best of both worlds. And we're really excited that we think we have a very good um, solution in that realm for robots that actually can, can uh, do some real work. Our future work includes both on-orbit and ground testing. So um, we have further development of a lot of the IBA tasks. I mentioned a lot of that as we were going through it. We're also um, going to be on-orbit, um, skipping on the last bullet, doing a lot of the EEA task development grapple hooks and um, more of the soft goods, blanket manipulations and that sort of thing. Down here on Earth, we are hoping to work on advanced path planning and obstacle avoidance. We go back to the picture of inside of the space station in the US lab. Um, there's a lot of need for this. We're hoping to um, have a vision system do some of the obstacle avoidance, but if not, have the operator take a picture from a robot's eyes give them keep out zones, and then have R2 actually do some advanced path planning through that to understand how to get all the degrees of freedom and not to hit anything and that sort of thing. And we're working with Rice University, Lydia Krabaki's group, to um, implement her state-of-the-art motion planning algorithm into what we are doing. And that is all I have. Any questions? Yes. Uh, well, one, uh from uh, Space Odyssey 2002, they had a HAL 1 computer, and now they had the HAL 2 computer that was out. I haven't downloaded it because I wasn't sure of all the bugs that might be in it. But are you thinking about uh, intelligent computer using that uh, with this system here, with the robotic systems that you're using? Uh, and also, uh, one of the presentations this morning was on uh, surgery, surgery. Mm -hmm. and uh, we're watching the robotics here. It looked like it would be, it's almost kind of working towards that type of uh, process here on Earth, where it could be used <coughs> instead of uh, not necessarily space, but here on, on Earth. Yeah. Oh, so to the second part of your question first, uh, one thing that I didn't talk about that we've done in the past year on space station is teleoperation with the astronauts. Crew members are actually teleoperating this robot, a lot like what happened with the surgeon you know, teleoperating the robot um, for, for the brain surgery. Uh, we're hoping to do that for the com more complicated things that we'll do on EVA. So we'll kind of autonomously climb someplace and then a crew member will don the stuff that, you know, the teleop gear and actually help, you know, you know bolt something down or, or whatever else it needs to do. The intelligence part, um, I think a lot of people that don't play with robots 
think robots are a lot smarter than they are.